Hello, hello, once again, this is Steve D of the YYT, once again for a Deck Tech Talk. Cast your mind back, if you will, to the golden days of FFTCG, before Corona came and ruined our event scheduling. Mono Water was one of the staples of the format. It was, for a time, a top tier deck, and for a time after that, still a very stable deck that could do a little bit of everything. If you wanted to play Fasoya, you could do that, but even a standard mono water deck was capable of playing Swarm games with Layla Viking, control games with a Kagnazzo loop uh, as the game went on. You had an interesting selection of summons. You had one of the first truly unfair backups in Yuna, making all of your summons cheaper. It felt like a deck that could do a bit of everything with a steady hand and a sort of a careful nuance and attention to planning. It is very pleasant and a, a very pleasant surprise for me to be able to say that I think that Mono Water is capable of doing that again this set. Mono Water is so neutral just now that while this like Tross and Folka Tross still exist, you totally can play them even though they lost a bit after the Mashery ban. I have a Mono Water mid-range deck that feels very much like the classic old days of FFTCG. So if you know any friends who are on the fence about rejoining the TCG, or would enjoy seeing what water looks like these days with a swarm plan and a mid-range plan and a removal plan and a rush plan all in one big deck, then uh, give this a go. It's really entertaining and very, very powerful. At the centre of basically everything water-based in Opus 17, we've got three copies of Glaciella Was It. Glaciella, if you are uninitiated, if you're one of those Opus 6 players looking back in FFTCG, she gains crystals on entry, a kind of token that sits outside the game. On entry, you gain one crystal. You can use crystals instead of S's in any of your FFBE characters' specials. This is the only special of any real note in the deck, but there's lots of ways to gain crystals. That means there's lots of ways of paying 2 CP to blow up one of your opponent's things. And that's really powerful in a deck that generates a mono water, very large hand quite conveniently, but also hits five backups with a reasonable regularity. Glaciella is exceptionally powerful and at the core of what makes this deck and a lot of water decks tick. So let's go over all of our crystal generation. Oracle, very simple backup, gain a crystal on entry. When you do so, it basically feels like you've added a card to your hand and that card is your second copy of Glaciella. Two copies of Sarah Mobius. It's a card that I'm appreciating more and more, to be honest. And that's not meant to be a Mobius, you know, sound alike pun. On entry, you gain a crystal. Whenever you gain a crystal, you get to look at the top card of your deck, either move it to the bottom, or if it's a backup, you get to draw it. This kind of soft card advantage goes a really long way in clever games where you try and outvalue your opponent over time, and that's exactly what midrange is trying to do. On the slightly lighter end of the scale, we've got two copies of Gao. On entry, you gain a crystal. On damage three, he becomes bigger. Two copies of Ramada as well for those thirsty people looking for their Atelier Ryza lookalike. On entry, you get to bounce one of your opponent's forwards back to hand and gain a crystal. And then she has a special two that you could use with Glaciella's crystal ability. Uh, she will gain haste, she will gain 2000 power, and it hits your opponent for two damage instead of one when she hits. I have been kind of against putting Ramada in a lot of decks before, partly because I was very fixated on machine-like two-color decks. And I feel like Ramada is one of the most cuttable slots in a two-color deck because her special does not translate to card advantage the same way that Glaciella or Gargas in Wind and stuff like that does. But in Mono Water, simply, there's a lot more room. We can play these Ramadas with a little bit more impunity. The last of our crystal generators is the very odd Realm. On entry, you can bounce one of your forwards back to hand or a monster back to hand. That could even be Realm herself to gain a crystal. This was a little soft loop that existed back in Opus 15, but it was rather expensive just to gain crystals because we didn't have a superb payload. But if you really wanted to, even at a desperate moment, you could play Realm onto the field, gain a crystal, bounce herself back to hand, and then discard that Realm for a Glaciella special. This is actually quite powerful stuff. There's a couple of other abilities here that we'll get into in time. For one crystal and tap, you can search for a monster of cost two or less and play it onto the field. If you really want to, you could play one copy of Tross just to toolbox out, or you can search for a more expensive monster up to cost five for two crystals and tap. This deck can generate a surplus of crystals, uh, even though this engine looks quite compact and quite light. It is not uncommon to hit three or four crystals or something like that, or in infinite time, infinite monkeys, infinite typewriters, Realm can generate infinite crystals as well. Other payloads for crystals, you are probably not surprised if you follow the game in recent times to see Lena. On entry, you can pay one crystal and two crystals, or both if you so desire, to resurrect respectively a forward of cost two or less and a forward of cost three or less. This is at its most powerful when you then get Gao and Glaciella Wazette to then regain two crystals and have two Glaciella specials ready to go. Very powerful. Lena is kind of the spiritual successor to Layla Viking, I feel. Although in this case, it's more like Layla Viking, second Viking. 
Another couple of oblique uses for crystals in the deck, we've got Atomos. Atomos is a just about strict upgrade over Fanfruit from the good old days of FFTCG because it's a one-sided sacrifice effect. Right now there's a couple of decks going around that play high value forwards on turn one. Basically anytime Samurai's is good you have to prepare yourself for the possibility that you'll see Samurai's in Swiss and you will see a turn one Tenzin and Atomos is cheap enough that I don't mind playing it on turn one just to get a Tenzin off the field before their end of turn trigger and uh, th this gets a lot easier if you went first and you can maybe play a unit as well to make the Atomos cheaper. You situationally can pay crystals to make Atomos cost one instead of three but realistically the crystals are better served on these couple of forwards here. Something really interesting you can do in mono water. So far all of this stuff has been quite, you know, yeah, this is Glaciella stuff, but what, what does mono give us that's actually unique? And the answer is in a very particular pile of cards Lena can pull out that basically says you win the game. And this is where those nostalgia players will be really happy. I'm talking about a full playset of Cagnazzo and two copies of the new girl on the block, Venera Fens. Venera costs one CP less for every crystal you control. Venera has haste, and when you attack, you can spend a crystal to shrink your opponent's board by 5k. Kanyatso, on entry, you reduce your opponent's forwards by 1000 for every two water characters you control. That means that off of even as low as four backups, you can play Lena, resurrect Kanyatso and Venera, attack with Venera, your opponent's board loses 8000 power. That is almost certainly a checkmate, that is almost certainly a one-sided board wipe. For a mid-range deck like this, it's important to also have plans to go on the beatdown. You know, you're not always going to outvalue your opponent in super long games. If you're playing against a really heavy Althea setup deck, then you probably need to take the fight to them and go swarmy. Kanyatso is still useful in those kind of games because even a 2000 power reduction to your opponent's board realistically says they cannot profitably block anymore. When a 9k becomes a 7k, that is time to take the fight to your opponent, and this deck happens to be very good at that as well. On to the rest of the summons, but before we do that, a shout out to the OG of the old days of FFTCG, a contender for the best Opus 1 card that still sees tournament use today. We've got backup Yuna here as a very powerful tool in long games for making our summons cost one less. There are a couple of 1CP summons that you don't get to make cheaper, but Yuna, in addition to providing 1CP by dulling every single turn, makes the rest of our summons 1CP less, and that is quite a noticeable difference when a Tomos costs two, and Leviathan from Opus 16 costs three CP. Leviathan, if you're unfamiliar, you get to choose one of your opponent's forwards of cost five or less, which is a great deal of the game, and then put it either on top or on the bottom of your opponent's deck. If it's something weak that doesn't have a particularly powerful on-entry effect, you can just shove it back on top and then your opponent will maybe waste a draw step getting back a useless card again, or you can put something powerful on the top of your opponent's deck and then deal them damage to guarantee that card is lost forever. Leviathan is quite powerful in this way for dodging EX bursts or playing around the possibility. I'm playing two copies of Sildra, not the full three because I reserve three Sildra for really low backup decks. And although this deck is on 14 backups, which might sound low if you're returning to the game, the tempo of the game is rather different these days and 14 is, I would say, kind of average. So two copies of Sildra on, en uh, well, you cast Sildra, I was going to say on entry there. When you cast Sildra, you search for two water characters or two FF5 characters. In this deck, that just means water characters of different costs and add them to your hand. You totally can use that to get a couple of different backups. You totally can use that to get a Glaciella to get her on the field. You don't need to search for Glaciellas for specials, remember, because Glaciella is kind of a self-fulfilling engine in that sense. The last of the summons, two copies of 1CP Kuchulain, is just super flexible in all kinds of matchups. I keep talking about Samurais as an example, but it is probably the most common deck at a tournament level just now. Little things like turning off he, uh, he ends double attack ability, turning off Cyan's ability to wipe your board, turning off Tenzin's draw at end of turn or draw when he leaves the field functionally. Kuchulain is just very powerful in all sorts of matchups. It's really just down to your imagination how you use it. It wouldn't be a good mid-range deck if there wasn't a simple board wipe we could play. So three copies of 9CP Leviathan, definitely the costliest part of this deck. Well, I say that, but we don't know where Glaciel is going to end up, do we? It could be an NFT right there. Uh, Leviathan gets to bounce a bunch of stuff back to our opponent's hand on entry and then reduce a forward anytime something goes back to hand. This does give us a little bit of a soft combo with Realm here, and if you want to play Tross in the deck as well as a silver bullet that Realm can search, I would not blame you. Tross is a superb card. I just quite like the selection of summons we have here. Two copies of Porom, another one of those iconic cards from the mid-years of FFTCG. When he dies, taking back a summon is very efficient, basically breaks even on cost, and that means it's very easy for you to go wide with little fear of being punished. 
Two copies of Tidus as well, really powerful card for closing out games. If you are the aggressor in a game and deal 5 damage or something and then your opponent stabilises, Tidus is a nightmare of a card to drop down, so it's important to know when to search for him with Sildra and stuff like that, or if you want to make the deck even more summon and even more tross heavy, you totally could do that, but Tidus is probably one of the cards you don't cut. Very very useful card for how difficult he is to efficiently remove from the field. I feel like that's the case for a lot of the cards in this deck. On to the backups mostly, one other little piece of interaction but we'll get there. Three copies of Sarah. This is not a surprise in any water deck, being able to search for any prince, princess or king is a super powerful effect. The cards we are searching in question, apart from more copies of herself or copies of Lena in the forwards, realistically we're going to want to get our backups set up first, and it just so happens that I think Gordon is a super powerful card in mono water. If you're unfamiliar, Gordon on entry, you get to draw a card, then discard a card, and you optionally may pay one water CP to draw a card as well, and importantly, you can stack these abilities in either order. If you don't have a particularly amazing start, you can go turn one Sarah, search Gordon, turn two, play Gordon, dull Sarah for that one ability, and basically draw two cards, discard one. Feels a little bit like Gordon was free or something when you do that. Very good for curation and sculpting your hand for what you're going to need to see in a given matchup. One copy of Hilda as a resurrection effect and a powerful draw EX burst as well that Sarah can search. One copy of Artemisium is a really useful card in low-ish backup decks to mulligan into a kind of a better future. One copy of Merle Whip to search for any of our water forwards. It's a total toolbox and very customizable. If you don't like the forwards here, you can stick in all manner of things that are justifiable. Merle Whip is still a very strong card to this day. And one copy of Kimari. Kimari is another card that's very hard to fit in a deck that doesn't play Sildra or isn't playing Mono Water, but when Kamari is good, he is great. Basically says one of your forwards is damage proof from summons and abilities. In particular, that is good for things that people want to kill all the time, like Glaciella, or cards that are very vulnerable to board wipes and not much else, like Tidus. It means that your opponent basically has to play Shantoto or a huge board wipe that breaks, like a Shadow Lord or Titan or something, just to kill Tidus, and that doesn't seem very effective now, does it? Lastly, one copy of Octo Mammoth. I love this card in mono. I kind of love it with Leviathan. I certainly love it with Realm. It's a really powerful bounce back to hand effect. But if you want to play Tross or something instead, or as well, I would not blame you. As always, decklist is right there in the description. If you want to try and mess about with this list a little bit, I'd love to hear your experiments. Notable omissions include Lakshmi. I really do like Lakshmi. If you want to play some number of Lakshmi, totally wouldn't blame you. Great card. You could take out the Octomammoth, you could take out the Ramada, you could take out one or so of the Kanyatsos if you want, but uh, do look out for that board wipe. It is devastatingly powerful when your opponent is fearing it coming. Thanks so much for watching. This has been Steve D of the YYT. Please sit, stay tuned and sub if you like to the YYT if you are fond of this type of video. Bye bye now.